Hello, I'm Carol A. Breckenridge, and I have played and loved clavichords for many years. This video seeks to introduce the clavichord in the areas of history, repertoire, technique, construction, and voicing, and was inspired through mu Early Music America's Joan Vincent Clavichord Award, which I was very honored to receive in 2022. Also participating, and I'm very grateful for their participation, are Karen Hudson Brown, Philippe Litzler, Paul Irvin, and with Paul Hanau during the recording. The clavichord has had a remarkable history from the Middle Ages through modern times because it is not only a useful practice instrument but also very satisfying and enjoyable to play. It likely evolved from the monochord, a keyboard with but one string. Tangents on the ends of the keys struck the string at different points to produce the different pitches. You can see in the photo, the upper instrument is a copy of a monochord of about 1425, built by Michelle Chiaramina and owned by Gregory Kroll. The lower instrument is a reconstruction of Arnaud de Svol's drawing in a treatise of about 1425. Note that more strings and keys have been added and the keys are at various angles to hit the strings at the correct positions to produce the pitches desired. Up through the Renaissance, most clavichords were of this type. In German it's called a gebunden or bound clavichords, in English we call it fretted, in which some adjacent keys have tangents that, that strikes the same pair of strings. By the 17th century, they were usually uh, double fretted. There were also earlier some triple fretted and quadruple fretted, but it kind of settled down to double fretted. In, uh, and in this uh, arrangement, C to, sheep, C to C sharp are bound. And this means you can't play them both at the same time. Or if you go down, nothing. Uh, so you have to be careful how you're moving from one to another. C to C sharp, D is free, E flat to E flat, or E flat to E natural, R bound, F to F sharp, G, G sharp or A flat, A is free, and then B flat, B flat to B are the, are the usual, it's the usual arrangement of bound together uh, keys. Um, so, as I mentioned, these keys that are bound together cannot be played at the same time, and a perfect legato or overlapping legato is not possible, but the music of the time was usually perfectly uh, suited to a gebunden clavichord for three reasons. One, chromaticism was rare. Uh, secondly, tonalities with few sharps or flats were usually composed, such as C major, G major, F major. Uh, and until the 18th century, um, detached notes were, were pretty much the norm. I'll talk about the 18th century a little bit later as things changed. <clears throat> um, because of the sharing of these bound strings, you can see that you don't have to have as many strings in a case. So the case is fairly small and um, this made it very convenient as, a, as an at-home practice instrument. And in fact, it became the primary domestic keyboard instrument in uh, at least continental Europe and was the basic practice keyboard for nearly all composer performers. It was considered by many to be the best for establishing a sound and expressive technique. Georg Lulein stated in his Klavierschule of 1765, Quote, without doubt, any clavichord is better for a beginner than a harpsichord or pianoforte. For whoever learns on these instruments, harpsichord or pianoforte, will never obtain refinement in touch and expression like one who has started on the clavichord. The clavichord's low volume range brought, brought out a very highly personal approach to the instrument. This became uh, a personal uh, a personal instrument. And further, unlike the organ or harpsichord, subtle dynamics were possible. In my opinion then, since the clavichord was the primary practice instrument uh, at, the t at least until the time of Beethoven, 
dynamic nuance became an expected part of expression, even on harpsichord and organ, which can achieve the same effect of dynamics through articulation and timing. Such nuance and expression can be heard in music by the 17th century composer Johann Jakob Froberger. Although a German by birth, Froberger settled in Vienna and also traveled extensively, including to Paris, Italy, and London. His music can be considered a composite of international styles and contains deep personal expressiveness. Like all keyboardists of the time, he would have played clavichord in addition to other keyboards, and his music is well suited to the expressiveness of the instrument, as can be heard in his Toccata in A minor, played by Philippe Litzler.
Johann Sebastian Bach's biographer Forkel stated that the clavichord was the composer's favorite instrument. His so-called chromatic fantasy, although dramatic and powerful on a harpsichord, gains new dimensions of dynamic nuance on the clavichord. In fact, the piece was uh, written in 1720, the, the first version, it was later revised, but in 1720, Bach's uh, wife, his first wife, Maria Barbara, died. And considering these two facts, um, we can conjecture that the feelings that Bach had, that the sorrow that he had from his wife's death, um, were likely communicated to this piece, as in many, many of the moments are very tender and mournful.
Even in modern times, the clavichord has been appreciated, and many compositions for the instrument have appeared during the 20th century on. Karen Hudson Brown will play two such modern works, one from 1926 by Herbert Howells and the other by Mary Lou Pascal of 1985. Herbert Howells wrote a collection of pieces for the clavichord, directly for the clavichord, called Lambert's Clavichord. And the very first one that I would like to play for you is called Lambert's Fireside. Now I would like to play a piece by Mary Lou Pascal, which was written in 1985. It is called Sweet on the Augmented Fourth. The first movement is called Toccata. The second is a Sarabande. And the third is Gig.
By the 18th century, the clavichord's qualities of expressiveness were becoming more appreciated. Especially in Germany, it was considered the instrument for the most intimate, personal expression. The writer Schubert wrote in the late 18th century, quote, Have no regrets when alone under the moonlight you improvise, or when you cool yourself on a summer night, or when you celebrate a spring evening. Ah, do not lament the thundering of the harpsichord. Look, your clavichord breathes as sweetly as your heart. During the 18th century, larger five-octave clavichords were built, such as this one, which was built by Paul Irvin in 1995, as uh, uh, modeled on a 1765 Friederici. These now are free of bindings, they're called Bund frei, or unbound instruments. So every, um, every key has its own pair of strings. And chromaticism becomes simple. Like that, unlike on the, uh, on the gebunden, or on, on the uh, fretted clavichord. <clears throat> this gives the, the player complete freedom in such passages, and it also enables a refined use of legato which was becoming more commonly called for, along with a desire for a more natural singing melody. The Adagio Sissimo from J.S. Bach's early work, Departure of His Beloved Brother, laments the brother's absence and contains a great deal of chromaticism. This is much easier to navigate and more expressive on the Bundfrei clavichord.
Carl Philippe Emmanuel Bach admired the French style for its singing and legato approach, stating in his 1753 keyboard treatise that French pieces contain a, quote, flowing and correct style with no lack of held tones, unquote. In the same chapter, his acerbic wit flashes as he proclaims, quote, keyboardists can be heard who, after torturous trouble, have finally learned how to make their instruments sound loathsome to an enlightened listener. All other instruments have learned how to sing. He had quite a sense of humor. <laughs> Emmanuel Bach was especially drawn to the clavichord's expressiveness. His career trans Trans, uh, transpired entirely in northern Germany, Berlin, and Hamburg. Although the Italian galant, or so-called comic style, was becoming most popular, Emmanuel was drawn to a more personal expressiveness and the sensitive style, on Fienzigkeit, particularly found in northern Germany. Although Emmanuel did play early pianos of the time, primarily Silbermann pianos at the court of Frederick the Great in Berlin, and by the end of his life, a square piano by Friederici called a clavecin royal. The piano was nevertheless a re relatively newcomer, having been invented only around 1700. In his treatise, Emmanuel seems to admire the piano, but prefers the expressive qualities of the clavichord, stating, quote, the more recent pianoforte has many fine qualities. It sounds well by itself and in small ensembles. Yet I hold that a good clavichord, except for its weaker tone, shares equally in the attractiveness of the pianoforte and in addition features the Bebu and Tragen der Töne. It is at the clavichord that a keyboardist, keyboardist may be most exactly evaluated. So Bebung and Tragen der Töne that Emmanuel mentions, what were these two unique features of the clavichord that are not possible on any other keyboard instrument? Bebung is simply vibrato, made possible on clavichords because the tangent remains against the string for the duration of the tone, and you could push the string further down by pushing the key further down, it raises the pitch, thus enabling vibrato. Oops, let's try one of the center. Here. Like that. <clears throat> Another unique effect on clavichord is traga der Töne, literally meaning carry the tone, which Emmanuel Bach described as, quote, added pressure after a keystroke. This extends the duration of the tone and also raises the pitch slightly. It would be probably just one extra pressure as you're holding a long tone. Here. So if you did not use it, the tone would not sound as long. But if you put that added pressure, let's try another one. You can hear that expressive device, which I used at the end of the Bach Chromatic Fantasy on the um, side. Oops, sorry. Like that. And also in his Adagio Sissimo uh, Lament on some of the mournful appoggiatures. Emmanuel's late composition, Farewell to the Silvermann Clavier, was written in 1781 upon his selling a beloved clavichord by Gottfried Silvermann. Bach wrote to the new owner that, quote, this is proof that one is also able to compose lamenting rondos. In this composition, Bach expressly indicates the notes upon which Bebung, or vibrato, is to be played by a tiny slur with dots underneath it, as you can see in the score that will be shown. Yeah, um, yeah notice the measure, the first and second measures, for instance, there are three instances of it. So this is 
a, um, yeah, this is the notation that he uses. Although the clavichord had a much lower volume level than the harpsichord or fortepiano, this feature is also one of the reasons that it is so personal an instrument. In addition, the fading out of tones into silence is used in this composition to enhance the mournful and intimate nature of the piece. Emmanuel Bach also notates extremes of dynamics in this piece, from pianissimo to fortissimo, and even a crescendo.
Although Haydn and Mozart gravitated to the emerging piano for performance of their works, they also played clavichords throughout their lives. Three of their clavichords survive to this day, two of Mozart's clavichords, one a small traveling instrument, and the other a larger clavichord, upon which, his widow stated, he composed the magic flute, as you can see in the image. And Haydn's extant clavichord, upon which he reportedly composed the creation, which you can see in the next image. Many of the works by Haydn and Mozart sound well on clavichord, as can be heard in Haydn's 1789 sonata in C major, Hoboken 48. The first movements on Dante con Espressione brings out much dynamic nuance with notations from pianissimo to fortissimo, as well as crescendos and diminuendos, indeed reminiscent of Emmanuel Bach.
The next section of the video is dealing with the technique of playing a clavichord. <clears throat> because the action is so different from other keyboard instruments, um, it's, it's very necessary to consider how to produce a good sound. In fact, as a clavichordist, you are creating the tone to a much greater extent than on any other keyboard instrument. How your finger approaches the key and holds the key down and so forth creates the tone quality. So for a beginner, I think there are four basic principles of technique. <clears throat> One, hold the tangent with an even pressure. Second, what I call cling to the key. Third, the fingers at the very edge of the key. And fourth, keep the fingers on the key before depressing. I'll talk about those in more detail. The first, hold the tangent with an even pressure, steadily and with sufficient pressure, <clears throat> to hold, to, to get a good tone. If you just tap the key, you're, you're not going to get a, just going to get a sort of what's called a chucking sound. So you have to have enough pressure. But you don't want to overdo the pressure and raise the pitch. If you push really hard, you're going to raise the pitch, which, as we just demonstrated, is sometimes desired for certain expressive notes, but not as a just a general rule. <clears throat> the first exercise I think that would, that would be valuable for a beginner is just to play the, the middle three fingers, just one hand, slowly, and listen to the sound that, you're, that you are producing. Maybe play each finger several times, see if you can improve it. And also play it at different dynamic levels. Loud, medium, and soft. Soft is going to be the most challenging, but it's very important, as you hopefully heard in the, in the music, uh, the dynamic nuance is so crucial to the expressiveness um, and what this instrument can do. So it's very important to learn how to play softly, but yet still get a pure, full sound. The full sound. Okay, um, this, the second technique is what I call, to me it feels like clinging to the keys. So, and it it's a backward feeling, if you were, for instance, if you were on a high wire and clinging to that wire just with your fingers, it's kind of that feeling. Everything really happens with the fingers, so you want the fingers to be firm, but everything else um, very relaxed behind it. And in general, you don't, you don't use arm weight. If you want to have more nuanced, you want just the fingers really to be moving, but as I said, they need to be strong. And if you think of pulling backwards, although your finger won't actually need, and I don't think it should move on the key, maybe in the beginning, just to get the feeling, but it's this feeling of backwards. Um, <clears throat> and one of the things that I've found that helps me is just, I actually sit further back, my bench is further back than I would on any other keyboard instrument, um, partly for that reason of feeling this sort of backward clinging to the keys. The se then uh, the second exercise you can do is with two, three, four, five. And you'll probably immediately notice that four and five are weaker, so so you want to you know to listen for that to to work on that so that those fingers are just as strong as the as the other ones. Um, the third 
technical principle is you must stay at the very edge of the keys to get the best sound. Is just how the leverage works in a clavichord. If you play up high up on the key, it's really hard to get a good sound. So you want to stay right at the edge. Now this has major implications for fingering because what what would work on a piano may in many cases would be disastrous on a clavichord in, in certain passages. So for instance in the Adagio Sissimo movement, um, if you look at measure six, measure six, yeah, there's a, a side, D flat to C, which on a piano you could just easily play three two or or a harpsichord. But this puts the second finger in not such a good position. So I use three, and the finger that's in a better position is the thumb. So three, then the thumb is right there at the edge of the key. And it works, works much better. <clears throat> uh, other instances of what seem to be unusual fingerings, uh, for instance, in measure 18, a D flat to C, in this case I'm holding a lower note, so I, so I had to use four and then five underneath it. Because if I use five, four, again, the four would be in a very bad position, so. Whoops. Yeah. <clears throat> and other, other instances. I advise in the beginning, if you're a beginning cloud course, write your fingerings down and think about that, that, the necessity of staying at the edge of the keys. After a while, it gets, it will get more automatic. <clears throat> oh, and also, if you have a roll chord, to stay at the edge of the keys, you need to roll or swing your arm. Again, to stay at the edge. If you play it like this, then the middle fingers are going to be right there where it's not a good position to get a good sound. But you could do this. And there you have, you're staying at the edge of the key and getting a good tone. <clears throat> The fourth principle is have your fingers on the keys before depressing, not from above. If you, go, if you go from above, you're going to get a slapping sound. Not very nice. You have to be on the key, which is a good principle, really, for any keyboard instrument for, for good efficiency of technique. But on the clavichord, it's really even more so important because Again, how you approach the key is going to affect the tone. <clears throat> Close, direct contact with the keys is really imperative for a good sound. Now, the next part of the video is about construction and voicing. It's necessary to have a well-regulated and voiced clavichord so that you, you have the, the opportunity to hear beautiful tones, and very dynamics are easily accomplished. <clears throat> uh, in fact, Emmanuel Bach referred to this and the necessity for a good instrument in, uh, in this statement, quote, in order that the strings may be attacked as well as caressed and be capable of expressing purely and clearly all degrees of forte and piano, the strings must be resilient. So that's just one one, as, one aspect of a well-regulated instrument is the resilience of the strings. <clears throat> but there's, there's so much more involved. A clavichord constructed and voiced as closely as possible to historical instruments produces a clear singing tone with an easily responsive action. So it's important to understand the basics of a well-voiced instrument. Now, Paul Urban, builder and restorer of clavichords as well as harpsichords, will discuss these aspects. All right, this section <clears throat> will be about regulating and voicing clavichords. Uh, it will not deal with inspecting clavichords in case you want to buy one to know what's good, what's not, but just the features in clavichords that can be adjusted and the conditions improved for better sound and playability. Um, 
Before I get to those exactly, I should explain some of them for those people who are somewhat familiar or perhaps to refresh and emphasize to those people who are familiar with the clavichord. <clears throat> the clavichord does not have straight keys like on a piano that go back all the same. They're cranked at various angles and that's been developed by the designers to achieve various effects that interact with other elements, which is why this instrument seems so simple. It's a rectangular box, which things come up and strike the strings. But to make it musical and not just something that makes sounds, it gets rather complicated when you're dealing with this small amount of energy. Uh, we're not plucking a string to get a lot out of it, and we're not hammering with a big mallet to get a lot out of it. So these leverage points are not, not the same from top to bottom. They change, which gives the different keys different amounts of leverage, which ties in with where they're striking on the string. Uh, and the feel and the back weight and so forth is all intimately tied together. So this will come up when I actually get to talking about adjusting some of these things. So the leverage will change. The leverage here in the bass, here's where you play, that's the pin, this is where it strikes. Up here at the top end, where you might see, this is where you play, here's the fulcrum pin, and that's where it strikes. So obviously it's much further away, it's got a longer lever, and this allows more acceleration for these strings down here, because if you were to try to hit against these strings, you'd be really bending them in sound, and they just would not have a sweet sound. So they make up, have lighter weights, lighter weight lever back there, but you sped up the acceleration. So it moves the same distance, but faster within that distance. And this has less force. If you had the same kind of leverage going on here, you'd have a very difficult time controlling it, going it down to the base, okay, broadly speaking. <laughs> Um, the same thing with this, but it is not like a piano and a little bit like the heart to go, but not so much. The, the key dip will be varying across, not from note to note, but there's very often a bit of a slant, more dip in the bass, less than the top. This also goes along with organs and so forth at the time, so it's not unusual, but it's all t getting mechanical advantage and reducing disadvantages. This bass string is hitched right here, it plays here, and sounds the soundboard down here, and it's only this far away from its tuning pen, okay? It's not an accident or it looks good that way or anything else, it's intended because when you have this kind of leverage here, it would be very easy if that were the middle note to bend notes and so on. So you're restricting some notes, you're making other notes easier to play, by having a very long overall string where most of the string is the sounding length, then a little bit of movement of going, I would say stretching and going out of tune, doesn't impact it because it's such a large percentage of the total string. Back here where you have this tiny, you know, five inches or so is here and the string is that long, okay, then you're spreading in a different direction to make it easier for the sound to propagate and to not be so fussy. If you were to hold these pins right up against here, then it's the slightest little bit of humidity change, the hygrometer will tell you immediately that that note's out, okay? So you're spreading things around this way. So that's the, the pre-lengths, as I like to call them, before the sounding length, and then the post-lengths. Once you have an instrument, it's pretty much fixed but you have to appreciate what, what happens when you change gauges, for instance. If you want something louder, you're going to put in another string that's thicker in there and so on. Well, those gauges have been very carefully picked to, again, elicit the most musical possibilities and evenness in the instrument. So when you change a gauge, you'll affect how the note feels, because there's more resistance. Okay? You'll also affect how it relates to the soundboard. Okay? All the earlier harpsichords, earlier clavichords, and so on, were lighter weight, smaller instruments. They were also strung lighter because that kept them in balance. So if you 
when they got to this stage, the instruments were larger, had more weight, had more mass, had more stiffness, could handle more power, and then you had heavier gauges, so you could exploit and use that power with the instrument. If you overpower what the sound work can do, you get a pretty short sound that's dull. If you can't stimulate it enough, you just get a weak sound. So it's all a matter of balances and checks to all these different elements. Um, also, we have, as, as a feature in most historical type of clavichords, they don't, do not use lead weights in the back of the keys. You'll see a lot of modern designs use lots of lead weights back there to make the key don't go down, okay? That aspect was designed in by where I think these were placed. And the bass notes, take an easy one out first. Bass note, you play here, you pivot here, the tangent's here, but this doesn't do anything, right? But it's part of the whole weighting system. Okay, that's all built in, so you'll see a gradual change down there for that. There's only one major builder that I'm familiar with historically that, that did use lead weights, and that was the person who made the clavichord, the smaller fretted one, Hubert. And as part of that, he didn't have all this length in the back of the key. He shortened it up, okay, got rid of it, and then he could get the hitch pins closer to the beginning of the string, which allowed a firmer reaction to the tangent striking it. And because it was there, you could also use a thinner string, which sounds purer. So he managed to get some advantages by shortening that up, but the key was not as likely to go down if I just chopped this off, okay, is that. And it's not just for backfall, it's the whole idea is this is the mass, okay, that's striking. It's not just the tangent strikes the, the strings, but it's, that's the mass that's supporting that strike. You have impact and you have support, which is one of the things that makes it very tricky. Initially, coming away from pianos, perhaps, and harpsichords is you have to, you want to sound those strings, but then you still have to support what is actually a bridge. Okay, if you have a, a weak bridge in the back, you won't get it to propagate well, and it won't sound good, and so on. So, because if I just go like this, which you start out doing, you can hear it bouncing off. And that's a whole control that now is your responsibility, so to speak. Uh, the other keyboard instruments, strong keyboard instruments, have the support here, and they have pins by the nut, so that it's all supported, that part's done. With the clavichord, you have to su supply that support for the tone. So it makes it again trickier. So because Hubert took that, made a more compact design, gained some advantages having a small instrument. He could use strings that were lighter and sounded purer, but they were still tight enough held to work well. He had to add lead weights eventually. He didn't start out with lead weights, but eventually things moved up. And eventually, certainly the other makers, as evolving design went on, they had heavier keys. Some of them stayed with very, very light keys, very light, graceful, the Fritz and so forth, heart, heart, clavichord. <clears throat> but these are all elements, so if you want to just go ahead, well, I think I need more of this, I need less of that, it's not going to affect just the one thing you're thinking it's going to affect. It's going to affect about five other things in ways it takes it's very difficult to predict. Okay, um, I've been dealing with clavichords about 50 years, and I'm just getting very convinced how I still don't know very much about them, okay? Because things keep turning up. Um, one warning to, I guess, also historically, these tangents in historical instruments were made of very thin metal, okay? Usually brass, sometimes iron. That would be anywhere from three-tenths to a, a millimeter. Uh, about 12 thousandths of an inch or whatever, to uh, 1.3 millimeters, about five, five hundredths of an inch. But they were always kept thin, they weren't made very thick, and the fact that with this instrument, if you can see from that distance, we have solid keys here, and down here we have what are overwound strings, where, like in a piano, 
the bass notes get deep enough instead of having a solid string, it doesn't sound well after a while. You use a thinner string, which sounds pure, as in Hubert's, but you wound extra mass with another wire around it. Um, well, then if you have really skinny tangents coming up, it'll get stuck in between the windings. Or when you tune it, you tune it across one of those, and it's, it's not a good time. So these were made wider, various three different ways of making them wider, so the top on top on the very top of the tangent would be wide enough to span across these wound strings. But they didn't make the whole thing that width. They very carefully made the top thicker and the rest stayed thin, which makes it seem that they wanted to keep the weight light for a reason. They also wanted to keep it fairly adjustable and their materials were softer, which made it makes a dif difference in sound also. But, so perhaps between those features, you have some idea what we're dealing with when we start adjusting and regulating an instrument. Um, so I would say when you have an instrument, first take a look at it. One of the first things you're going to look from the front is see how even the keys, key fronts are. Tops of the naturals and the tops of the sharps should be even. This is like you would expect that in a piano. If you have keys at different heights, it's only a few people I've ever met that can adjust to that very quickly enough to not play poorly with it. So you want to get those adjusted. It can be adjusted by putting some paper, paper shims in the back here. Um, so that's fairly good. Next thing is how, if they're level, you don't want them crooked, you want them level and even for that. Adjustable, if it's crooked and leaning to one side, very often you can just get in there carefully and get the balance pin to be bent one way or the other and go in. But cautiously, because you also have a guide system in the back, you make it bend from what it's used to doing, then the back guide may bind up. That's the two points you have. Most clavichords don't work with front pins like the piano do. Um, okay, and then another thing to look at it, especially if you're experiencing noises when you're playing heavy or you're going boom and you hear scraping sounds, double check the path the tangent is taking as it goes up. It pivots here, for instance. It pivots like this, and you press down, this happens. But this is what? This is making a circle back there. You've got part of an arc that you're, you're working with. So when this comes up to strike its two keys, when it gets higher, it's gonna start doing this and coming forward. If you have a nice upright, perfectly vertical tangent, it's going to then go rub against in front of it. Okay, if it's already coming through this way, it can rub in the back, depending. So you want to have that tangent aligned with the arc of that. And you can just see it fairly easy by looking to see if it's coming through and maintaining good distance from the front and back strings. And if it looks like it's coming in and scraping or if it's too far back, you'll need to adjust for that early on. <laughs> This has sort of been taken in the sequence that I would use when I come to the clavichord I haven't seen before and I want to work it up. So, um, the tangent path, the tangents are usually, and all the time historically, these tangents are tapered. They're wider at, in the depth and narrower at the bottom. And this allows you to bend them forward or back a little bit. Warning there, most of the modern tangent materials are much harder than the historical ones used. And as a result, if you just take it and go to push it up, you'll probably enlarge the hole down there, okay? So if you're gonna do it, do it carefully. Pliers get a grip and do it down here. Don't do it from the top, okay? And even no matter what you do, by bending it doesn't work, then you may ultimately have to take it out and put a hole further back or further forward, whatever it needs to clear through these strings. Nothing, nothing is scraping or scratching in any of these, so that's a good sign. Uh, now, the next thing I notice immediately when I check out a, a, a clavichord I haven't seen before is having the name board off, I take a look right through here so I can see underneath the string band and look at the distance of all those tangents to their strings. Okay, And if I see a bunch of basically snaggletooth look to it, it's problems, okay? It's not 
irremediable, but it's not, it's not adjusted the way it needs to be to make playing even and your experience predictability. It's like a, a let off on a, on a piano. The let offs are all different places. It's much more difficult to control. And the musical qualities will change from note to note. Okay. So this is something you'll, you'll need to address. Um, one of the things, these in a sense you can look at as sort of upside down hammers. And they just happen to be hammering up against something, okay, like, like this. And if you have a hammer and you're going to be striking down, sorry, on top of a nail or something, okay, you're not, you don't want to, this is not a very efficient angle to pound a nail down, or this isn't very good. You want to pretty much have it perpendicular. That's your best transfer of energy. And the same thing is true with these little hammers coming up to hit the strings. It's best if they hit them squarely at a 90 perpendicular angle. If they're coming just past it and they hit, they'll be taking the strings and moving them this way. Or if you come up, because there's too deep here, you're going to come up and you're going to start moving in this way and then over. Okay? So you really want to have that initial contact perpendicular there. And that's, at that point then, what you're doing is getting the tops. Once it's square, then the next step is to adjust the tops of the tangents. Uh, well, I better back up a little bit because it's a case of, okay, you look at the clavichord and mine's not doing that. It's not hitting perpendicular, okay? So you need to really fix that before you go much further with your adjustments. Um, and that's really regulated by the height of sitting on what they call the balance rail here and how far the key leans back there. So if, let's see, if we have this sitting here and if it already starts out horizontal to the strings and then you go and play it, well when it hits that that was your string band, you're hitting that unideal, not perpendicular angle for that, okay? So that means obviously you need to start and then get that one to be down some. So you've got your playing distance and then you finally strike at the horizontal perpendicular, okay? So if, if, you, if you get that all set up so it's just like this and it's just hitting just a little bit like the stagger that we, we like, then you say, oh, I've got to lower that in the back, okay? Or I've got to lower this thing. I've, I've got to shim, shim the spacing up. You just change the geometry again. You have to know what to do in what order. Yeah. yeah. And even, even if you do them all in right order, you can still have to go around and touch up the effects of that too. So it's not just, yeah. this is five, this is two, this is six, we got it. Because changing all those things around affects the whole circuit. Yeah. Okay, so where was I? Okay. Um, this is all, let's see, this is, so, Keep it simple, I'm not going to fret it. Um, so these lift distances from the tops of the tangents up to the strings need to be even and they need to be hitting squarely. So let's say you went through and managed to get those. So when the key is just touching, it's hitting nice and squarely. It's got a good distance. And then now at that point, you take a look to see are they even? And they weren't, or you wouldn't be doing this at this point, probably. You would have ignored it. Um, and now you have to adjust the individual tangents. And this can be either fairly straightforward or involved. A lot of modern instruments have been made with very, very soft wood in the levers. And these harder tangent materials, so you try to bend things, arrange things, the holes get loose. So I've got it so adjusted and you go up against the string and the thing shifts back again because it's just too wobbly down here. Um, so let's say we know better than that at this point, get down to the bottom, put it forward and back. And if we have firm enough wood, then if this, this tangent's too, too high in the air, this has only got, this has this much and the rest of them have this much, okay? And by the way, how much should it be? We know it should be even, okay? And the other question about how much is variable, okay? It depends upon the instrument, it depends upon your playing style to a great extent. And it also play, 
is revealed by what's the distance from the top of the sharps to their naturals. Because if you want a lot of, you know, if, if you have a lot of distance to travel, you can really get a loud punch, punch to the note, okay? But it makes it, the more of that loudness you have, you're giving away, they have a very difficult time finding to control the quiet portion and the nuance and trying to get some color bending. It's much more difficult to control. So you want to try to find a sweet spot which ha gives you a good dynamic range and good control over that dynamic range. Uh, so we say this, this, I need to have a little bit more in this one because it doesn't enough and it's, when I get to it, I play the same as the other ones and this one's quieter than the rest of them because this one's higher and it's not going as far. So with these uh, I got get vice grips out, you can take a pair of pliers carefully and lock them on and just pull them out a little bit if they need to be higher or you can get the pliers on there and lock down and then you can just tap the pliers to slowly drive, push it down deeper. This should be a side friction fit from everything I've seen in my experience with that instruments, um, that's what it was intended to be. You say, oh, it's only holding by friction instead of having a good solid cement foundation at the bottom to keep the tangent in place. Think about how much resistance is it feeling? Right? It, it's only, it's, it's bending against this, okay? So as long as it's enough to hold it in place, not to get pushed back in from the strings, and let's face it, plus a little bit more to be safe, that's, you don't need to have these things glued in, okay? It's much easier if they're just snug and can be pulled in and out. Because if I had everything set up just right and everything's hitting square at that moment, okay, and I now push this one deeper because it's not enough, what happens? It comes up a little further. And now it's not hitting square and it's not hitting in this same time place. Same thing if you're gonna, if you're gonna pull it up so much, it's only have, gonna have a little bit of movement. So you have to keep all those things in mind for that. So if we have them hitting as perpendicular as works well, sounds good, sounds, gives you a solid sound, and, but it's a little uneven, adjust the tangents up or down, make it pretty much even. And it seems to be, at least with these large instruments, that it's pretty much, that's your even. If it's going to be three millimeters or five millimeters in between there, whatever it is, that's the, the one regular measurement you have, and the key dip will vary from that. But historically, that wasn't a big deal. You expected to have to move the pallets for, for pipes and all this thing, or, or larger strings. The harpsichord, you expect to need to have to push more in, and the harpsichord actually is also slightly tapered. So that's not the no-no that modern pianists, this should all be even, okay? doesn't, you know, a gamba doesn't feel the strain the same on the bass string as it feels on the treble string. That's just a fact of life and was at the time. So you can adjust these tangents so you have that nice striking point that's even. You found your golden spot of, I can play loud I want, I can see. and so on. And then it's a case of the tangent comes up, it hits the string, it's hitting two strings. Okay, there's very, very rare, less than a handful of instruments that were ever one strong clavichords. Same reason, actually, why you don't find single strong pianos. Make a nice small piano that way, but they don't do it. They did for a little while. But, so, but if you hit those strings exactly, you know, spend half an hour making them hit exactly at the same time, it sounds kind of dull, it doesn't sing very long, <laughs> okay? Because actually having strikes slightly different, differently, the initiation points are different, and then they start working again. And if one starts to fade, it's a coupling effect, which is why pianos and lutes and clavichords are double strung. You want those strings not to just act as one, they're actually working with each other, okay? So if you, preferably the back one, if you put the front one to go first, then you're gonna have a harder time of getting things not sliding off and so on. But the back one usually strikes first, just slightly, okay? And you can hear this and you can work with it. Um, once you get past a certain point, the, the speech, 
the initial tone gets a little bit buzzy because it's actually experiencing da-ding, da-ding, it's happening because you're hitting and this thing, ba, you know, bum, 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 as you hit the strings, okay? So if you go too far, that's gonna show up. And on your releases, as you release, right, this way, this one's gonna come down first and then the second one comes down. And as, it, as that first one comes down, the string is picking vibrations up with that one, it's still vibrating and you get <laughs> on the releases. So if there's too much of a spread, very difficult to get clean releases. You don't want to have to always go like this all the time to make it at once. So a little bit of difference, a slight difference, and you can hear and play, play with that and see, what, see what, how it affects things. That gives you a much livelier sound, a much longer sustain, um, and easier releases Okay, for that. So um, now it's a case of whatever the tangents are in your clavichord, They'll even be as wide as they are for the whole distance, and you have a choice of how how wide do you want that contact area against the strings to be, okay? As in the string I know that I have pulled out before, and sent the keep out. This has, in this section, a little bent over, because these wound strings, you don't want to fit in between with the skinny tangents, so you've got a wider surface so that those wound sections will be on top all the time and nothing's going to fall in between which seems to be if you think about the classic example is high heel shoes right you have a hundred pound woman ever walking around with high heel shoes on what happens in soft flooring right okay the hundred pounds puts holes and marks and so forth okay because it's all concentrated this is it's the same force it's still a hundred pounds of force but it's in a much smaller area Okay, so your the pressure increases. Okay, and that's one of the things I think with our getting back to clavichords, we used rather wide tangents and had a hard time making them not seat. They would go and so forth. They would want to bounce. The strings were made for bouncing. You're trying to make them bounce, but they're bouncing against what you're trying to support them with. And this is like chucking, spitting, um, blocking. It's called and so on but it's really increased the larger the surface contact you have, okay? If, if it's a 100 pound person walking around with great big boots on, okay, it doesn't put much pressure on the floor, okay? If you're walking around with high heels and you get the heel all by itself with 100 pounds each time you walk, then you have that. In this case, we're gonna have that work in our advantage, so we're having the tops of the tangents as slim almost as possible for that. With the same amount of finger pressure, you have a higher pressure contact between the strings and the tangent. It's kind of hard, hard to figure out for a while, but it's the force is the same. I'm holding it with this. But if I held it with a very broad surface, the whole thing would be spread over. So if that force is spread out, and then you can get this type of thing happening. So you can either cut it the tangent at the top perfectly flat and do that, or bevel it. Okay, and this in the wound strings you have to do a, a wide top. These solid strings you have a choice, and they, usually some people put a, a crest. They, they file it so it's a crest across the top, and but it tends to make you know it's, that's about as narrow as you can get. But uh, it can be a little bit too much, and in the string perhaps damage, or if it gets a little bit nicked because when you tangent hits the strings, especially if you're going to blow bone, you'll see it going like this on the tangent. It's moving. So any little bit of nicks or scratches in there is going to show up instantly in the sound going into the strings to your soundboard and broadcasting it. You know, it doesn't know any better. It's just going to broadcast those noisy, noisy sounds. So that's a little bit risky. It's possible. Um, other thing is keep it fairly blunt and just bevel the edges. My preference for the sound, and it fits with the physics, is to make it rounded, okay? So you've got your top of your tangent and it's already slanted a bit, a little bit taller in the back perhaps in the front, but now I'm gonna take it, I, once I've got that angle set, now I'm gonna file those sides a little bit and file them and then make it a little bit smooth, so it's essentially, it's some kind of a, a round top. And that's 
approximates pretty much what happens with the string's contact with pins. It's a round surface. So that the string can come in any, any angle to that pin and it's always packed to the same contact area Okay, for this. Um, so I prefer to do that and it stays pretty good and I like the sound so far. And, uh, but you can listen and try different shapes you want to and see what, what, what seems to work best to give you basically the most musical resources for your plan. The idea is to have as much to work with as possible. Um, yeah, okay, so we have that shape and we've shaped this. We've shaped the tangent tops for that. And um, let's see. The main thing after that, and once you use a file, go through with some smooth sandpaper. I had that before, but we have tangents. Once you have the shape put in, you can lay a piece of very fine sandpaper, generally not in the hardware store except the fine stuff. And then you can just rub on this like this and then tilt it a little bit. And like that, just to make sure it's all smooth. There's no scratches left in the file on it, because it will be like fingernails on a guitar string. It will be broadcast for that. So also in that regard, these are almost always brass now um, of different hardnesses. But it turns out that I mean we've all seen nice bright brass hardware, and after a while it starts to get dull. I mean even, even when you have Super super finishes on it. It wants it wants to corrode a little bit. It just does. It's a very soft corrosion, but as a consequence, that soft corrosion is now what's hitting the string after it forms. So you, you're coming up, you're hitting the string, but that's actually you don't see it. You probably might not even feel it, except it doesn't feel quite as slick um, as it did when it was shiny. But the very small forces. I mean, this string string vibrating. You know. Hard to even see it vibrate. It's a very small force that has to move that. If it comes up and hits this for it, a rather sludgy substance, you sort of get a, and the speech gets a little bit funky. It sort of goes thunk and it doesn't bloom. And you want, for a loudness, loudness is good as long as it continues, okay? If you go, it's all over with nothing. And these instruments, clavichords, are really all about the first keyboards that had dynamic range and they also had color nuance because you had the control over the strings directly. You weren't just plucking it or striking and letting go of it. So it seems very small but it's significant. In fact, I think we had that last week with somebody in the room where we took these out. Now, if they're really old and have a lot of corrosion on it and so on, then you might not might want a really fine 400, 600 type of sandpaper to, to buff it, okay? Remember what happens when you shorten tangents, okay? You get too vigorous with trying to get all that stuff off. You just made the tangent shorter than it was before. You just changed the playing distance. It won't happen that quickly, but a few years of doing that, it might. But for, for the easier stuff, just have a good, good uh, nice rough paper or something. You can just take that like I did with it. With uh, filing it, you just rub that top where you're perpendicular to what you're doing, and then just round it over a little bit to make sure all that oxide is gone and you're back to nice fresh metal. Um, by the way, Clavichord International for anybody watching this should should be having this. And if you want more than I'm telling you now, and whatever minutes this takes, then Peter Babington has an excellent third edition book here on the maintenance and tuning a lot of them tuning. <laughs> but he's an excellent builder for years, he's sort of retired now, but has done excellent, excellent work in building them and also in exploring and doing all this maintenance and so on. Um, so, so you have to clean the tops, which seems like such a fussy thing, but I think you have heard immediately what happened to the notes, and it is kind of surprising. And you'll just, if you have the paper, it's a white piece of paper, and you rub it, you'll see a little black streak there there was something on there, and that's what came off. Okay, so you're back now to hard metal contact, which is, lets things vibrate the best. Um, the only other thing, major or basic on that, is probably the listing cloth, okay? And the listing cloth is there to damp this part of the string on the other side of the tangent. Otherwise, we'd have this, which gives us our G, 
and then we've got some kind of length which gives some other pitch, and you don't want to hear that, okay? But there seems to be a tendency to fill all the space between the hitch pin rail and the tangents with a lot of cloth, so it won't make sounds. These tangent tops are actually just, the string doesn't vibrate up to that point and stop. Okay, it's not, it's, not a, it's not like a bridge pin or a nut pin so much. There's nobody, it's still, the, the string is still vibrating over the edge of that. So it's, it's always passing some of its vibration back to the, that cloth. And so you can't stop it, that's just the way things are for that. But the less cloth you have, the better, because it just damps that down. Um, but you need enough so that if, this is still being silent. That's really, I feel, all you need to have. And it's more cloth. I've worked on this with some people, including Richard Trager on this. And the more cloth you have past a certain point, you'll just start muffling and quieting the instrument and shorting its sustain. Something else to find the golden, golden mean or Goldilocks point in between for that. But this one has it down here. These strings are heavier, wound strings in the bass. But hear that? becomes a drum. If you get all this section filled with that cloth, you've made a drum head, and whenever you hit one string, it's going to sound all the other things. You get sort of a thumping sound going on, you can't quite get rid of it. So this down here is... It sounds as quickly afterwards, the notes are good. But if you try to get all this up in here, these notes will become weaker, fuzzier, less distinct. And so there's no sense in overdoing it to just give more cloth so you can absorb everything that comes past those tangents. Um, so things to play around with and experiment. Be cautious in those things that, that if you have to go back and redo it, it's not a major project. So do things in small increments and listen to which, what it is, the effects that are going on that way. And try to find the sweet spots, the Goldilocks spots, and all these different adjustments.